This video begins with a brief overview of health history taking, followed by the anatomy of the nose, examination of the nose, including the internal and external surfaces, and the paranasal sinuses. Anatomy and examination of the mouth, as a healthy patient. In clinical practice, you may detect the same normal findings, or you may discover normal variations or abnormal findings. The Health History Interview is a conversation with a threefold purpose. To establish a trusting and supportive relationship, to gather information, and to offer information. In the case of new patients, you will gather information that will form the basis for a comprehensive written health history. For patients seeking care for a specific complaint, you may prepare a more focused, problem-oriented history. In either case, you will record the patient's chief complaint, along with common or concerning symptoms. Common or concerning symptoms relating to the nose, mouth, and neck include nosebleed or epistaxis, sore throat, hoarseness, swollen glands, and goiter. By eliciting the patient's concerns before the examination, you prepare for an examination that is efficient and productive. With the patient's health history in mind, you are now ready for the examination. Before beginning, let's review the anatomy of the nose. Approximately the upper third of the nose is supported by bone, the lower two-thirds by cartilage. Air enters the nasal cavity by way of the anterior nares, passing on either side through widened areas known as the vestibules. Air then passes through the narrow nasal passages to the nasopharynx. The vestibule, unlike the rest of the nasal cavity, is lined with hair-bearing skin rather than mucosa. Protruding into the nasal cavity are the turbinates, curving bony structures covered by a highly vascular mucous membrane. The nasal septum forms the medial wall of each nasal passage. Like the external nose, the nasal septum is supported by both bone and cartilage. The medial wall is covered by a mucous membrane well supplied with blood. Below each turbinate is a groove or meatus, each named according to the turbinate above it. Draining into the inferior meatus is the nasolacrimal duct. Into the middle meatus drain most of the paranasal sinuses. Their openings are not usually visible. The paranasal sinuses are air-filled cavities located within the bones of the skull and lined with mucous membrane. Before you start your examination, make sure the examination equipment is within easy reach, including otoscope, tongue blades, and gloves. Begin by inspecting the anterior and inferior surfaces. Note asymmetry or deformity. Some asymmetry of the two sides is normal. Test for obstruction by asking the patient to sniff gently. Go ahead and put one finger against one side of your nose and sniff. And then repeat the same on the other side of your nose. Then tilt the head back, press gently on the tip of the nose, and shine a light into the vestibule. Look for deviation of the nasal septum or signs of inflammation. To inspect the inside of the nasal passages, use an otoscope with the largest cap or speculum available. Be sure to insert the speculum carefully, avoiding contact with the sensitive nasal septum. Note the color and condition of the nasal mucosa that covers the nasal septum and turbinates. Normally, the nasal mucosa is redder than the oral mucosa and displays no swelling, exudates, or bleeding. Look for any abnormalities, such as polyps or ulcerations. Repeat this procedure on the opposite side of the nose. Make it a habit to place all nasal and ear specula outside your instrument case after use. Then discard them, or clean and disinfect them appropriately in accordance with the policies of your institution. Conclude your examination of the nose by palpating for sinus tenderness. 
Press on the frontal sinuses, avoiding pressure on the eyes. Then press up on the maxillary sinuses. Any pain or tenderness? No. The lips are muscular folds surrounding the entrance to the mouth. When the mouth is open, the gums, or gingival mucosa, and teeth become visible. The gingiva are firmly attached to the teeth and to the maxilla or mandible in which they are seated. In lighter-skinned people, the gingiva are pale or coral pink and lightly stippled. In darker-skinned people, the gingiva may be diffusely or partly brown. A midline mucosal fold called a labial frenulum, connects each lip with the gingiva. A shallow gingival sulcus between the gum's thin margin and each tooth is not readily visible. Adjacent to the gingiva is the alveolar mucosa, which merges with the labial mucosa of the lip. The dorsum of the tongue is covered with papillae, giving it a rough surface. Some of these papillae look like red dots, which contrast with the thin white coat that often covers the tongue. The undersurface of the tongue has no papillae. Note the midline lingual frenulum that connects the tongue to the floor of the mouth. At the base of the tongue, the ducts of the submandibular gland, known as Wharton's ducts, pass forward and medially. They open on papillae that lie on each side of the lingual frenulum. Each parotid duct or Stenson's duct, empties into the mouth near the upper second molar, where a small papilla frequently marks its location. The buccal mucosa lines the cheeks. Above and behind the tongue, depressed here to facilitate identification, rises an arch formed by the anterior and posterior pillars, soft palate, and uvula. Between the pillars on both sides of the mouth, tonsils can be seen in their fossae or cavities. In adults, the tonsils are often small or absent. Between the soft palate and tongue, the pharynx is visible. The hard palate forms the roof of the mouth. Before examining the mouth, ask the patient to remove any lipstick or dentures. Then inspect the outer surfaces of the lips for symmetry, color, and moisture. Note any ulcers, cracking, scaling, or masses. Go ahead and open your mouth. With good lighting and the help of a tongue blade, inspect the oral mucosa for color, ulcers, white patches, and nodules. Observe the gums for signs of inflammation, such as redness or swelling. Also inspect the teeth, noting any abnormalities. Next inspect the hard palate for color and form. Then, inspect the soft palate and uvula for redness and swelling. Go ahead and say, ah. As the patient says, ah, or yawns, note the movement of the soft palate and uvula. The soft palate should rise symmetrically, and the uvula should stay in the midline. If the patient's tongue obstructs your view, use your tongue blade to depress it. Inspect the anterior and posterior pillars, tonsils if present and pharynx, looking for redness, exudates, or ulceration. None should be present. Continue by inspecting the tongue. Note its symmetry and color. Inspect its dorsal surface, which is normally roughened by papillae and sometimes covered by a thin white coating. Inspect the undersurface and sides of the tongue and the floor of the mouth. Look for white or reddened areas nodules, or ulcers. If you need to palpate anything within the mouth, wear gloves. Before we examine the neck, let's look at the pertinent structures. For descriptive purposes, each side of the neck is divided into two triangles by the sternomastoid muscle. The anterior triangle is bounded above by the mandible, laterally by the sternomastoid, and medially by the midline of the neck. The posterior triangle extends from the sternomastoid to the trapezius, and is bounded below by the clavicle. 
A portion of the omohyoid muscle crosses the lower portion of the posterior triangle. Inexperienced examiners may mistake the omohyoid muscle for a lymph node or mass. Deep to the sternomastoids run the great vessels of the neck, the carotid artery, and the external jugular vein, which passes diagonally over the surface of the sternomastoid. An understanding of the following midline structures is also key to a successful examination. The thyroid cartilage, readily identified by the notch on its superior edge. The cricoid cartilage, the tracheal rings, and the thyroid gland. The isthmus of the thyroid gland lies across the trachea below the cricoid. The lymph nodes of the head and neck are identified here using one of several classifications. The overlying sternomastoid muscle largely obscures the deep cervical chain, but at the extremes of the chain, the tonsillar node and the supraclavicular nodes may be palpable. Knowledge of the lymphatic system is important to sound clinical examination. Whenever a malignant or inflammatory lesion is observed, look for involvement of the regional lymph nodes that drain it. Whenever a node is enlarged or tender, look for a source such as infection in the area that drains it. To begin the examination of the neck, inspect for symmetry while standing in front of the patient. Look for enlargement of the cervical or submandibular glands, and note any visible lymph nodes or scars. If you see any masses or swellings, palpate them for size, consistency, and tenderness. Next, palpate the lymph nodes. Using the pads of your fingers, feel for the preauricular, posterior auricular, occipital, tonsillar, submandibular, submental, superficial cervical, and posterior cervical nodes, and the deep cervical chain, including the supraclavicular nodes. Note the node's size, shape, delimitation, mobility, consistency, and any tenderness. Normally, some small, non-tender nodes may be felt. Tender nodes suggest inflammation. Hard or fixed nodes suggest malignancy. Now inspect and palpate the trachea for deviation. Next, start the examination of the thyroid by inspecting the patient's neck. Ask the patient to extend his neck back slightly as he sips some water and swallows. Observe for upward movement of the thyroid gland, noting its butterfly-shaped contour and symmetry. Identify the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, and the location of the thyroid gland. Now watch again as the thyroid cartilage Cricoid cartilage and thyroid gland all rise with swallowing. Go ahead and swallow. Normally, they rise with swallowing and then return to their resting positions. For the examination of the thyroid gland, either the posterior approach or the anterior approach may be used. For the anterior examination, from in front of the patient, check your inspection by palpating the cricoid cartilage as your landmark. As the patient swallows, feel for the thyroid isthmus and the adjacent lobes of the thyroid. Now move behind the patient and place the fingers of both hands on the patient's neck so that your index fingers are just below the cricoid cartilage. Again, ask the patient to take a sip of water and Go then to swallow it. Feel for the thyroid isthmus rising under your finger pads. Note the size, shape, and consistency of the thyroid gland and identify any nodules or tenderness. If the thyroid gland is enlarged, listen over the lateral lobes with a stethoscope to detect a brewy, a sound similar to a cardiac murmur, but of non-cardiac origin. 
Okay, we're done with the exam. Great. Okay. A clear, well-organized clinical record, employing language that is neutral, professional, and succinct, is one of the most important adjuncts to patient care. For a healthy patient, your write-up might include language such as nose, nasal mucosa pink, septum midline, no sinus tenderness, throat or mouth, oral mucosa pink, dentition good, pharynx without exudates. Neck, trachea midline, neck supple, thyroid isthmus palpable, lobes not felt. Lymph nodes, no cervical, axillary, epitrochlear, inguinal adenopathy. To summarize, examination of the nose includes examination of the anterior and inferior surfaces, inspection of the vestibule, inspection of the nasal mucosa, and palpation for sinus tenderness. Examination of the mouth includes inspection of the lips, the oral mucosa, gums, teeth, hard and soft palates, uvula, anterior and posterior pillars, tonsils, pharynx, tongue, and floor. Examination of the neck includes inspection for symmetry and for enlargement of the submandibular gland, inspection and palpation of the lymph nodes and trachea, inspection and palpation of the thyroid cartilage and cricoid cartilage, and inspection and palpation of the thyroid isthmus and thyroid gland.